This video is sponsored by World Anvil. We've been discussing character death over the past two videos, but there's an aspect that we really haven't talked about yet, because it really requires a dedicated video. When your character dies, it feels bad. Well, yeah, okay, that's pretty obvious. Didn't really need a whole video for that one. But I actually think this is something that's really important to keep in mind when you're running your games. Now, by no means am I suggesting that you should make all of your characters unkillable. There's an excellent argument that character death needs to be on the table in order for D&D to function, and while that's not always the case in every RPG, it's not unreasonable to find yourself in a situation where a character might get killed off. And it might not feel good, not just for the player in question, but for everybody at the table. Even if everyone has already agreed to it, even if they all know that there's a risk their characters will die, losing a character you've invested a lot of time into still sucks. So today we're going to talk about how to kill off player characters with dignity. How to make sure your players don't feel crappy when their character bites the dust. Maybe even how to make it narratively satisfying. That might be too much to ask, but we'll see what we can do. The first reason character death so often ruins a player's day actually starts before the character dies. Because most times, a character doesn't die fast or without warning. It's far more common for them to die in the middle of a combat encounter that had already turned against them, and probably to die from failing death saving throws, or to get killed while they were unconscious because something showed up to finish them off. Going unconscious during a long, brutal fight already sucks, then just rolling a single death save on your turn and then waiting 10 to 20 minutes until your turn comes back around so you can roll one more death save and then wait again, that also sucks. And all of that comes before you actually fail that third death save, or lose all your death saves when someone plunges a sword into your unconscious body. Basically, in the moment characters die, their player was probably already having a bad time. So one solution to help prevent the character death from acting as the cherry on top of a crap sundae is to make death saving throw rolls feel like a bigger deal. When a character is unconscious in my games, and then whenever it comes to their turn, I don't just like to say, make a death saving throw, have them roll, and then move on. Instead, I describe what they're experiencing. Although honestly, sometimes I'm happy to give the player some agency to describe what they're experiencing on their end, if they have any ideas. As an example, in a recent game, a character went unconscious, and I turned to them and I asked them what they experienced on the other side. But they didn't know how to answer. Which was fine, it was the first time someone had gone unconscious in that campaign, so the players didn't really know what to expect, which basically meant that I was putting them on the spot, which I did not mean to do. And I'm more than happy to take the reins in a situation like this. So I described how the character found themselves in darkness, but felt like they were teetering on the edge of a cliff, looking into a pit they couldn't see. That represented death. And they heard their father's voice behind them whispering to them, I expect better from you. That was me fishing around in their backstory to give them something to connect this character to this experience. Their father wasn't dead, which is why they were behind the character, potentially able to pull them back if they succeeded on further death saves. With other characters, it can be a lot easier to figure out what they're experiencing. If they've lost an NPC who was important to them, then maybe they'll interact with that person on the other side. That's a trope we've seen a hundred times in plenty of movies where the character almost dies. And as the character takes further turns, you can reflect their successful and failed death saving throws in what they're experiencing. Maybe the character is standing in their childhood bedroom and they hear their dearly departed grandmother uh, calling from the other room. They might walk through the house looking for their grandma. Whenever they fail a death saving throw, you can describe them getting closer to their grandmother's voice, maybe close enough that they can actually see each other, maybe even almost close enough to touch, certainly close enough for the grandma to deliver a final word of wisdom. But if they succeed on the checks, they just keep finding empty rooms, their grandma's voice getting further away, or they feel like they're just moving in place. Now here's the thing, and this might be specific to just me, but when I'm narrating these scenes, I don't always like to confirm that what's happening is unambiguously supernatural. I know that's a funny thing to say about a game where some characters can talk to the gods and others make deals with devils and ghosts are a thing, and maybe it's just the influence of all these movies and TV shows that don't want to commit to a clear answer about whether the character is actually crossing over to the other side or not because they don't want to alienate their audience by establishing something that might feel out of place. But I think this philosophy also works well for our D&D games. After all, when your character flatlines, it's not like you're going to have them make a deal with a god or a devil on the other side, are you? Well, you could, it depends on the game. Uh, there's a scene from Fantasy High where some major plot stuff happens while a character is flatlining, and those events do go on to have a huge impact on the rest of the game. And in my Strahd campaigns, that's specifically something that can happen when the characters die, to help the players keep playing the same characters if they want to. But if you're not doing something like that, where you give the players a boost or some connection with a higher power when they come back from the brink of death, 
then there's no reason to confirm one way or another whether what's happening is definitely real or all just playing out in the PC's imagination. Annoyingly, Harry Potter offers a really good example of this. I don't like referencing this franchise, given everything the author does with their platform, but the near-death experience in Harry Potter did actually completely hit the nail on the head when describing the ambiguity I like to bring to these near-death experience scenes. Is this all real? Or is it just happening inside my head? Of course it's happening inside your head, Harry. Why should that mean that it's not real? This phrasing sums up exactly how I handle it in my own games. And the way you can capture this feeling of ambiguity is that you don't give them any clear answers. You can have a beloved deceased NPC say something cryptic yet meaningful, like, you've always trusted yourself. It's time to try trusting someone else. But they shouldn't give actual advice, like, when you wake up, go talk to the hag in the swamp and ask her to tell you where to find the Sword of Shadows. That Harry Potter clip continues with Harry just straight up asking, what should I do, and getting no response. This is a hallmark of this sort of scene, and so it's important for you as a GM not to take advantage of this moment to give the players a commandment. None of these types of scenes do that, so if you do, you're changing the tone of the scene to something less emotional and more plot-driven, and I don't recommend that. You will go to the Dagobah system. Dagobah system? There you will learn from Yoda, the Jedi Master who instructed me. Yeah, there's a reason this happens at the beginning of the movie when nobody assumes Luke is actually going to die here, and not in his final moments. Because a death scene, or a near-death scene, is just the wrong time for that type of exposition. Speaking of things not to say, I really wouldn't recommend you have the players hear something like, it's not your time yet. Because if you say that when they get healed, but then they get knocked unconscious again in the same fight, or maybe even die, then you're gonna feel pretty foolish. I tend to prefer, you've still got things to do. Of course, it's very possible that they're going to fail those death saving throws and shuffle off to that big binder of D&D character sheets in the sky. And in the moment when they fail, then if you're already describing some sort of out-of-body experience, I would just recommend that you describe a moment of peacefulness, as a beloved long-gone NPC from their backstory takes their hand or something like that. And you can even frame this as posing a question for the character to consider. Something like, come on, stay with me, at least for a while until your friends come to get you. If you want, you can stay longer. Something like that actually puts the question out there for the player to consider. After all, as I said in my first video about character death, you should make sure your players know that if they want to roll up a new character or wait for the party to try to resurrect them, they have that choice. And having someone in the afterlife ask the same question would actually make it diegetic and give the player a chance to start thinking it over as their character. Of course, it's very possible that there were no death saving throws, and the death happened fast, so none of that applies. And that's okay. Hell, maybe everything I've described so far just isn't your speed, and that's okay too. But there are a few other things you can also do to make sure your player's characters get to go out with some dignity. First of all, when a character dies, it's a big moment. So as soon as it makes sense to do, pause the game. Finish out the battle, and obviously if Revivify is on the table, go ahead and resolve that. But if that's not the case, then as soon as you're able, as soon as you're out of initiative and out of danger, as soon as you're not going to destroy the pacing if you give everybody a breather, then it's time to pause. Take a break or call the session for the night. Give everyone a moment to process. It doesn't matter whether there's no resurrection in your games or whether every local priest has access to true resurrection. Unless the character's body drops and skids to a halt at the steps of a temple, character death is usually a pretty big deal. And your players are probably going to feel some kind of way about it. Let them. And give the players a chance to deal with their feelings in-game as well. One of my favorite moments in D&D ever came when my wizard died in a brutal fight. And in the aftermath, the players found a letter on my body, which I'd actually written a few adventures earlier, though uh, some of what was in there still applied. And I just watched as my players read the letter, took a moment to process a lot of complex emotions, and then they started talking about how to bring me back. My character was on their feet in less than 45 minutes. Well, his, his new feet. They cast Reincarnate and turned him into a halfling. But yeah, it wasn't exactly like my character's death was the end of his story. But it was still so wonderful and cathartic to just decompressed from that fight and processed the fact that one of our characters was dead, and we needed to just take that in before we started talking about how to revive him. But of course, what if the player doesn't want their character to be revived? We've talked about this before, but maybe they'd actually like to roll up a new character, or maybe it's just time for them to leave the group. Ideally not because they're upset their character died, but because they feel like this is a good place to wrap things up, or because they just don't have the time to commit to the game anymore. I've talked before about the reasons some players might leave a game after their character dies, and a lot of those reasons are valid. 
But something I would recommend is that you give some sort of closure to that character. Now, what that looks like will ultimately depend a lot on your campaign. But something that I would recommend is having some sort of funeral for the character. And you can even ask the player to write some final words if you'd like. Maybe this takes the form of a literal letter that you can retcon and establish as on the PC's dead body. Or maybe the character's voice enters the player's dreams that night and they all get a sense that their fallen friend is finally at peace. Maybe you can narrate that a new star is visible in the sky and tell the party they remember an old legend, not necessarily tied to any specific deity or religion, just an old story that says that a new star appears whenever a great hero finishes their work on this planet. You might recognize that as an idea I ripped off from a particularly powerful moment in everybody's favorite animated, jazz-filled story full of colorful characters just trying to earn a living, The Princess and the Frog. And yeah, that actually brings me to a useful point about a lot of the scenarios that I've discussed in this video. Steal your ideas from other things. Most of these are pretty tropey. These are directly inspired by moments from movies and TV shows and books and comics. And in fact, this is a trope that is not always handled especially well. In fact, there's one movie that goes for this same moment we've been discussing, but ends up being maybe the worst example I've ever seen. Hey, why would CPR help heal someone who got blown up? Does CPR help with internal hemorrhaging? We have been watching you a long, long time. You have fought for Optimus, our last descendant, with courage and with sacrifice, the virtues of a leader. A leader worthy of our secret. The matrix of leadership is not found. It is earned. Return now to Optimus. Merge the Matrix with his spark. It is, and always has been, your destiny. Why in the world would Sam Witwicky go to robot heaven? Why do the old Autobots look like demons? How the hell did he earn anything in the past 45 seconds? Why did a pep talk from some robots rebuild the MacGuffin? Are the ghost robots able to use their robot magic to reform it? Why is this the time to handle some exposition about how the MacGuffin works? I mean, the real answer is that this movie was filmed during the 2007 writer's strike. But honestly, the cardinal sin of this scene is that it's all plot and no heart. This doesn't serve the character who is actually on the other side. Like if your wizard flatlines and as you get close to the other side, to the veil of the afterlife, you meet the fighter's great grandfather whom neither of you have ever met and who you don't know anything about and who doesn't actually have anything profound to say to you, but just says, go back to help the fighter. That's not going to be an enormously satisfying moment for you as a player. And truthfully, you could probably find bad examples of all of these tropes across lots of media, but you can also find some that work really well, that are powerful and poignant. And I found that what makes these moments work best is that they are intimate. When we're playing D&D, it's so easy to get swept up in the big plot stuff. Maps and MacGuffins and villains and victims and other dimensions and gods and monsters. But at the end of the day, all stories are about characters. And that's especially true of D&D, where every player has a specific focus on making sure their character gets a chance to be awesome and have a compelling arc. And so when one of those characters dies, we have to take the time to offer everyone a chance to deal with that. And by giving them enough space to be loved and be mourned, you're sending them out with some dignity. Now, one last thing I want to address is that the less ambiguous you make a character's interactions on the other side, the more big world-building swings you're making. Like, obviously, there's an afterlife in D&D. There are ghosts and gods and stuff. But as we saw in the Transformers clip, if you don't think through the uh, consequences and implications of what you're establishing in these death-saving throw scenes, then you can wind up creating some buck-wild implications for your world. Like, I guess robots have souls in an afterlife, but they can also directly interact with the technology on the material plane. So, are they just in the cloud? No, because humans can also go to robot heaven, but does that mean that human heaven isn't real? Because why wouldn't Sam go there? You can see how this becomes such a slippery slope if you're not careful. Of course, you can make things a lot easier for you if you do some prep and build out a few details of your world, or even just take the time after a session to record the things that you established about the afterlife. And all of that is easier than ever if you use today's sponsor, World Anvil. Here's the thing. 
We all want to have complex worlds at our fingertips with all the details figured out, but that's so often not really the case. More often than not, we're making up major details as we go. But thanks to World Anvil's professional templates and creative prompts, your players never need to know how much you are flying by the seat of your pants. They also only need to see the pages you share with them, so you can take your time and keep elaborating on details. And then once your players finally find the book of lore on any given subject, you can reveal the information in your World Anvil page, so you are still the deciding factor about how much information the party gets. And World Anvil is offering a discount to the viewers of this channel. If you visit worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek, you can save 40% off of any annual membership. Once again, that is worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you so much to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. And for sponsoring all three of the videos in this death series. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. This concludes this three-part series about character death, but this is likely a topic we'll come back to in the future. So I want to ask you, are there any aspects of this topic you'd like to see me cover in another video? Let me know in the comments below. While you're down there, make sure to like and subscribe and ring the bell. Support me on Patreon if you're able to do so. Join my Discord to hang out with other awesome people and sign up for my newsletter for updates. If you didn't see Thursday's video yet about giving player characters one final action when they die, then check that one out right here. Until next time, play fair and have fun.